Bach. So if we could, um, if we could begin, I'd, uh, I'd appreciate it. Quit sending me emails. Um, <laughs> never stop. <laughs> never stop. Good luck so, with that. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Kate. Okay, I will start with the uh, German script. I believe everybody is here. And um, so here goes. As chair of division two of the House Finance Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency Emergency Order Number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This public meeting uh, will be discussing amendments to HB1 and HB2. Note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the General Court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should email LBA underscore fiscal at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. LBA staff are on the meeting assisting us. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting which is required under the right to know law. Representative Lynn, I am glad you're back. And I know that Representative Petrie is really glad that you're back. So if you would, please. Yes, take. yes thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Buco, and welcome, welcome back, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm present. I'm at my home in Conway, and there's no one else in the house. Uh, Representative Heath. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Mir uh, Representative Mary Heath, and I'm here in my home in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I'm all alone. Uh, Representative Murner. Uh, I'm in Lancaster, home, all alone. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm Representative Lynn. I'm here in uh, Orlando, Florida, and I'm in alone in the room uh, at, at this time. Representative Petrie. Representative Petrie is in Farmington with just the dog today. Representative Murray. Kate Murray is in Newcastle uh, with just a dog. And Representative Umberger. Uh, yes, I'm in uh, in Kearsarge and my husband is in the uh, in the house someplace. But Kate, I'm happy to learn that your husband's not in the basement today. No, he's outside droning. <laughs> oh, that sounds <laughs> All right. like that. All right. And Representative okay. Weiler, you're uh, you're I, I guess a, a guest for for purposes of this meeting anyway. But welcome. Thank you. Okay, um, I have, we had discussed the amendment that um, Representative Weiler had uh, submitted, and we uh, asked him for uh, additional uh, information because. We didn't really have a clear um, understanding of what he was asking for. So Representative Weiler, if you would um, please tell us about your amendment and why you think it's important. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. 
uh, and my local school board is there's two towns represented and the way they read the law and, and so there's there's in effect i think two members from kingston two members from newton and one member at large and the way they interpreted the law if somebody resigned or died of any of those members that the uh, board would replace that member but it was they, their reading of the law was if it was somebody from Kingston, then really it only came down to the Kingston person would have a hand in selecting the replacement. But it, it said the person that was the at-large member, whether they were elected in Kingston or in Newton, were denied a say in who would, who would replace the uh, absent member. And it didn't make sense, especially if that person, the member at large was elected in the same town as the as the member that was absent. And even if they were from the next town, they were still uh, elected in the town that the person was absent from. So they, they had roots, they felt in both towns and it's, it's certainly in the town that they came from. And the board decided, no, that wasn't the case because you weren't uh, as a member, as the member from Kingston. But, but and, and they, they argued about that and it wasn't clear in the law. So they asked me to try to change the law. So it was clear that the at-large member, if, especially if they were from the same town as the, as the person being replaced, then they should have a vote in that or have a, have a hand in selecting that person. I agreed with that last year. I submitted the bill. It passed through the education committee. And the Senate, like so many other of our efforts, um, it, it either got, I can't remember exactly whether it got tabled or just jumbled in a bill with 24 other things, many of which were not popular. So it didn't go anywhere. And I forgot about that. I, I kind of lost track of it once I passed it through the House. And, uh, and the member that asked me to put it in called up and said, you know, that bill didn't go anywhere. I said, all right, I'll put it in again. But by the time they told me that, uh, we'd already passed the filing period. So I was hopeful that since it deals with education and Division II deals with education, that I, I could have it supported to put it in HB2 because it is, it is an important issue for my town. And it was passed through the education committee previously and, and uh, they supported it. So I'm hopeful that you will put it in HB2. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions that anyone has? Uh, Representative Murray. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And this is by and large my own education. Um, first, a member at large, it would be my understanding that that person isn't um, representing any particular area or issue or any entity in a committee. That's for me a definition of member at large. So, what does it matter if you're replacing a member at large where that member comes from? As you know, shouldn't it be a, if it's a member at large, shouldn't it continue to be a member at large? And does this bill kind of hamstring what the intent of member at large is supposed to do? Thanks. Thank you. I think it does in effect because the, the issue that, that brought it to a head was not the member at large replacement, but one of the other replacements. In this instance, I think it was somebody in Kingston being had, had resigned or died, or excuse me, or died, and they had to be replaced. And so the member at large was elected in Kingston and in Newton, and supposedly only the member that was elected as the Kingston member that was remaining would be the one that would choose the the uh, replacement. And that didn't make sense to the member at large because she was also from Kingston, so felt she had a right to pick the person or have a hand in it. So and I could agree with that. And I could see that, you know, if, if she was from Kingston and knew, knew the people in Kingston, that she would be just as likely to know who to put in that job as, as the one that was singularly elected from Kingston. So that's what the bill does. And, and I didn't even give it a thought to what would happen if it were required to be replaced. But I suppose Press every conference would put a hand in that one. Uh, Representative Murray, or Heath, I believe you are next. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just so I understand, 
um, in um, a consolidated school district, um, it's usually when they come together to be an SAU, uh, they merge and the SAU board it, and uh, the S it is the SAU board you're talking about, I presume. So the SAU board is weighted according to the um, populations of each town. And so what you are recommending is that when one of those at-large members had needs to be replaced, then in fact, it will be the whole body or just the single town from which that individual came? I'm trying to remember how it, I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's maybe the nomination would come from the people in the town that had lost the, the member. So if I could continue, Madam. Vote on it, but the nomination yes. would be from the people in the town. So um, would there be, there would be no vote um, and then the town then keeps control of their member and does not need to go out for a vote with all three towns. I wouldn't think it would. You know, okay. Maybe the total board would vote, but the nomination and, the, and, the, and likely uh, would come from the people within the town that lost the member. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Representative Heath, that person would only be appointed until the next election. Right. Okay, and so that would, you know, whenever, whenever that was. Yeah. Okay, Representative Lynn, you have a question? Oh, did you want to follow up, Mary? I did, I just wanted to understand the process. Um, so what this would do is simply solidify the process and there wouldn't be any questions. That's my hope, yes. Okay, thank you. Representative Lynn. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Representative Weiler, I, I, I understand completely what you're saying, and it seems to me this makes a lot of sense. Uh, the only question, the only question that I have is, um, and as you just as you just pointed out, what in in the example that you used, what it, it seems not to cover the situation where the person that uh, resigns or, you know, is, is for some reason uh, no longer a member of the board is the at-large member. And so I wonder um, how, how would we, how do it, let, let's suppose that that happens now. How, do, how is that at-large member replaced? I think the way, that, the way it reads, even if it's the at-large member, what town was the at-large member from and was remaining from that town would be the ones that nominate or appoint the successor. Okay, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. All right. Whether it, whichever town it was from. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there, Thank you. Are there, are there any other questions that anyone has? Okay. Uh, Mickey, I don't have the uh, amendment number in front of me. Uh, it's 0782H. Thank you. Uh, could I have a motion, please, to accept this amendment? So moved. Second. Second. Thank Petrie. you. Is there any further discussion? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Representative, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Buka. Yes. Uh, Representative Heath. Yes. Representative Murner. Yes. Uh, Representative Lynn votes yes. Uh, Representative Petrie. Representative Petrie votes yes. Representative Murray. Murray votes yes. Representative Umberger. Representative Umberger votes yes. It's a vote of seven to zero in the affirmative, uh, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next order of business is a um, report from uh, Representative Lynn on the um, Supreme Court decision on uh, 
education. So I will turn it over to Representative Lynn. I want to thank you all. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, so um, I, as I, I, I sent Representative Umberger a, uh, an email uh, yesterday, and I think, uh, I guess the, the bottom line, I suppose, the way to put this is that uh, it's a punt. The Supreme Court decision is sort of a punt in that um, it didn't make a final decision. It sent it back to the uh, to the trial court. But I, I guess, you know, reading uh, and, and this this is obviously I I'm not a member of the Supreme Court. I can't speak for the Supreme Court. I can only make some predictions and they may or may not be correct. But I think one of the one of the takeaways from this is that to the extent uh, that those challenging the, um, what the legislature had done with the school funding you know, in recent years, to the extent that they had the belief that um, they were just going to be able to say, um, you know, this is what, um, this is the cost of education that the education establishment thinks is what is, is, what is needed. And that was kind of going to be the end of it, which is sort of what the trial court did. I think the, the Supreme Court kind of, you know, threw cold water on that, that that's not going to, that's not going to be um, the way this is handled and sent it back to the trial court. And I would, I, and I suspect I could be wrong on this, but I suspect that this is, there's going to be a fairly lengthy discovery process and then a, a fairly lengthy trial on the merits where, the, where this kind of, this issue will be very, very hotly contested as to exactly what does um, an adequate education cost, what factors are, uh, go into uh, uh, establishing an adequate education. And I think particularly, I, I thought particularly interesting is there is language in the court's decision that I think, um, really raises the issue uh, uh, very squarely about not, er at least it seems to me, not everything that, it go that is a cost of education is a cost for an adequate education. In other words, there may be, there may be many things that, um, that a school district spends money on um, and I don't mean to say, and I don't mean to suggest that it's that, that spending the money is inappropriate, but there may be many things that a school district spends money on that the court will ultimately say, okay, that's fine, but that's not part of an adequate education. Um, so that, for example, I, I, I think that, as I understand it, the, the school districts uh, that were challenging this were saying, you know, the cost, whereas the legislature as in that basic appropriation before there's added for the free and uh, reduced lunch and other costs, uh, um, non-English speakers, that kind of thing. But in the basic um, cost of, of an adequate education, it was around, at, at, the, at the time, I think 2019, around $3,500 or $3,600. And the school districts were saying, no, it's sixteen or $17,000 uh, per student. Um, I think that, um, there's, that's, there's a great deal of room in there. And the Supreme Court, I think, uh, made it clear that, that, that it's not, it's not gonna, I shouldn't say made it clear, raised real, real questions about whether or not um, a lot of the things that school districts may uh, spend money on are really what is required for an adequate education. So, you know, my takeaway from this, as I said to Representative Unberger, is I, I tend to think that if I were a litigant on the uh, representing the state, if I were uh, if I were a lawyer representing the state, I would feel much better about the Supreme Court's decision than if I were a lawyer representing the challenge challenging school districts. That's not to say that they're ultimately. The school districts won't win in some fashion, 
But I do think that um, the, the people that were defending uh, the the uh, the legislative the defending the law um, probably are feeling uh, better about the decision than the people who were challenging it. So that's kind of. I'm, I'm happy to try to answer any questions uh, if anybody has any. Uh, Representative Murray, you have a question. Yes, thank you. Um, the Commission on Adequacy that finished its work just, I guess, in the past several months or so, um, do you think that being such a new report impacted uh, the court's decision to say, you know, you need to go back and look at this some more? And since that is out now, and it wasn't out when some of this was going on, do you think they will make either side will make use of the uh, findings from that commission uh, going forward to try to figure out, you know, answering the questions that you just asked? No, ex excellent question. And I, I think, you know, I don't, um, I don't remember the court referring to the newest report. And I think probably that's because that, um, I don't, that may not have been issued at the time the trial court made its decision. And so, you know, the way the process works is the Supreme Court can only consider what was before the trial court. So if the trial court didn't have the benefit of that, then the Supreme Court really, really uh, would have, it would have been kind of improper for it to, to consider it. But on remand now, you know, I, I think, yes, I'm sure that, um, you know, in, in term in trying to determine factually what, you um, what goes into an adequate education? Um, I'm sure that the the the, the uh, both sides will probably you know make reference to that, and the court, the trial court, I think will will almost necessarily have to you know at least deal with what uh, what that uh, commission said. You're muted, representative. I'm sorry, any other, uh, any other questions? I'm happy to answer if I can. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Judge, uh, for taking my question. Uh, are you familiar with the, uh, what happened in New Jersey? I believe they had a Claremont decision. Uh, their academic achievement has uh, not improved a bit and they're spending in the Abbott districts there, which are the poor districts, are spending over $44,000 per student. I'm not, I, I am, I sort of am generally familiar that there are, you know, there are a number, what you should bear in mind is this, uh, way back in 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court rejected the kind of, under the federal constitution, the kind of claim that was made in the Claremont case, uh, basically saying that, you know, there, um, there is no constitutional right to uh, um, an adequate quote unquote uh, education or equal funding of education. That's just not something that the federal constitution grants. So in the wake of that, a number of states, uh, New Jersey, Kentucky, and I think, you know, I'm not sure of the number now, but quite a number have, have said that their state constitution provides um, this protection. Um, I, the, the problem, and this is now, this is me speaking, you know, people may have, I, I understand that people have a much, people may have a much different take on this than I do, but this is me speaking. I uh, candidly think that it, that, that this is not a very smart move for states to adopt this because what it involves in the end is, um, you know, stop and think about this. The, the court, instead of, instead of us in the legislature, deciding how much money to appropriate to education. And I'm been, don't get me wrong, I personally am a, a, a very much favor the idea that poorer school districts ought to get aid from the state. I don't have any problem with that at all. But the idea that um, it, it shouldn't be the legislature that decides that issue, but instead the court, um, I, I'm, I think that's, I'm very uncomfortable with that because I think what it really means is let's, you know, let's, it, it essentially means that you've got the court substituting its judgment for the legislature on what 
on how much money is, uh, is appropriate to be spent on education and more importantly, what the trade-offs are. If, if, the, if education were the only thing we were spending money on, it might be one thing, but there's you know, a whole bunch of different things that we have to spend money on. And so the problem I see, and I think the, the, the states that have adopted this, they're, whose courts have adopted this, the problem is it's kind of never ending. So, you know, let, let's assume that the plaintiffs are right and that, you know, uh, the, the amount of money that's being spend, spent for an adequate education now, the court says that's not enough. Okay, so now we appropriate more money. Um, so five years from now or three years from now or 10 years from now, the, somebody will say, and, and this is I, what I think is the real problem. If this, by saying that this is a constitutional right, it really means that anybody, you know, it could be, it, 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 here it was a several school districts, but it could be anybody that can say, oh, wait a minute, I don't think the state's spending enough money, I'm bringing a lawsuit. And ultimately the court, as opposed to the legislature will decide how much money should be spent. That, that, um, I, I, I'm, I'm very troubled by, by that idea. So, but that's, the, that's my, you know, that's my personal take on this. And I think that the, the spending, I mean, I think that, that the New Jersey case and others in, indicate that the spending issue is not, um, is not uh, in any way kind of closely related to educational performance. I think that's, uh, at least that's my take on it. But anyway, that's the, you know, many of you may, I'm sure may disagree with that, but that's kind of my take on it. Uh, Representative Heath, you have a question? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is like an ongoing issue that has caused angst for many, many years. Um, I agree that, that the courts won't tell us um, what to do, but the courts will um, advise the body the general court, then in fact, they need to come up with a better way to meet the needs of children. In, the, in our, our national, uh, in our federal constitution, they left um, education to the states to decide how to determine um, how to address that issue. And so I, I do think that we bear responsibility. The other issue that really um, being on the school funding commission this this past year really pointed to the deep discrepancies in the level to which different communities can afford to really address the needs of education in their communities. You know, we just saw the huge difference in in the uh, property tax burden that different towns carry. And um, I think that's something that in all of this, and again, it, it goes back to the report from the commission. I think it's incredibly important that somewhere along the line, and I think we did that um, at, at uh, some point when we um, provided funding in um, one of our previous bills. Uh, and I just, I, I just think it's a consideration that we have to address because I think ultimately economically for our state, the product of the children that we produce in all our communities results in higher qualified future employers and employees. Um, thank you, um, Judge. I really appreciate your comments um, because it just it brings home so many of the issues we've we've really talked about for so long and and muddled with, and it's been very difficult. In terms of Massachusetts and New Jersey, I'd like to talk to both of those just quickly. Both of those states have undergone really total school reform and, and with that reform have seen significant improvements in their students' achievement. Um, as we know, Massachusetts is listed number one on the NAEP and New Jersey, which was drastically lower, has come up to one of the um, top states. So there has been improvement based on the additional funding provided. So um, I, I thank you, Judge, again, and I will be quiet. Thank you. Thank you. I hope folks will indulge me and allow Representative Weiler to ask a question. Representative Weiler. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Judge. 
it just seems like this is almost an annual thing. I know you've dealt with it at both Supreme Court and lower lower courts, and it, it's it never ends. And I think one of the reasons the union always is trying to kill the charter schools is they serve as a prime example that an adequate education can be done for seven thousand. But another <clears throat> issue that I've seen several members um, online tossing around is the unfunded mandate funded mandates. And I remember an earlier, um, I don't know if it was the Supreme Court or a circuit court with the decision, you know, if so we're spending about 40% of the, of the cost of or 30 or 40% of the cost is from the state. And every time the state decides there's going to be some addition to what's required, like a civics program or something, or then they come back and they sue and call it an unfunded mandate. And my reelection, uh, re my re remembrance is that the court said, as long as you're getting money, you can't say it's unfunded. It doesn't matter. They, you know, they don't tell you exactly how to spend the money, but they're giving you money. They give you a new mandate. You've gotten money. It's not unfunded. You think that's still the feeling? Thank you. Well, I, I, I say I, I actually had occasion. I was the author of the decision that said. Um, you know, it was okay for the state not to fund the municipal retirement uh, system. And that was, I think it was a four to one decision. I believe Justice Convoy um, dissented in that, but I think it was a, either a four to one or three to one decision. Um, you appreciate it. I'm but, the one that made the change. But it, um, one of the, I, one of the problems I think that we, you know, that we were, that was a basis of the decision and not the total basis, but in part was, that it's um, the th things like uh, like the like the retirement fund, and that I, I suppose it would have implications here. You know, for in the in the hypothetical that you pose, because if the state says, okay, you have to do, you know, you have to now teach X, um, presumably that's gonna that's gonna mean some funding for personnel, and yet the state has no control over personnel and, and that was one of the big things that you know the the the, the city of manchester or for you know from the, from the biggest city to the smallest town they get to make their own decisions on how much how many how much uh, how many how many employees they have how much their employees are paid and yet if they could if the if the you know, non-funded mandate provision meant that the legislature um, was kind of stuck with that. It would really interfere. It would really interfere, basically, with the legislature's ability to appropriate money and to decide how much how much funding goes to uh, to, to to various things. So I think you're right, and I think we basically did say in that case that if there's been, you know, if there's been um, some uh, if there's been some funding by localities for, 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 you know, sort of general categories of things like employees, then the state, um, then the fact that the state changes its contribution is not, uh, doesn't result in an unfunded mandate. Um, that, that, as I say, that's not the only factor. There are a number of other factors that went into it, but that's certainly one of them. Okay, thank you very much, Representative Lynn. Um, thank you. Uh, from uh, speaking to us from your experience, um, I think it's uh, insightful. And I know that we will all be waiting for whatever the trial court decides to uh, move forward with. And uh, I'm not sure that, you know, we'll have a decision on that during this legislative session, if in fact they do what they've been directed to do. So anyhow, it'll be fun. And uh, it may be, um, you know, two years before we uh, come up with any, any decision on that. So thank you again. And um, Mickey? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, we have uh, an amendment 
Is that the next thing we want to do? Uh, at this point, we have three amendments um, okay. to be considered, and one of the three amendments would require a reconsideration of an amendment with that we previously approved. So we can take these three up in any order that works for you. And um, if it's helpful okay. to walk through a screen share, we can do that. Um, you tell us what you want to do. Yeah, let's do the amendment on the 44 million. Sure. So this would be amendment 2021-1019H. Uh, uh, and I think this was sent out to everyone last night. It is online as well. And this is an amendment that, uh, that would require a reconsideration of amendment 0989H that we had previously adopted. And the reason for that is uh, both amendments ultimately result in a transfer from the education trust fund to the general fund. Uh, the amendment 1019H takes into consideration previous actions and updates that transfer amount required. We would not want to pass both. So we would want to supersede 0989 with this should the division adopt it. Okay. Um, you want to uh, walk us through what what this is uh, suggesting? Sure. So Andrea has the amendment shared on the screen right now. So um, as of all the committee's action to this point, um, there is about uh, 40, just over $41 million remaining in the education trust fund based on the revised House Ways and Means revenues. So what this amendment would do is essentially um, appropriate some general fund dollars for the Department of Transportation. This is the section uh, one that you see lines uh, one through 11. Of that $19 million, $4 million would be for <clears throat> highway block grant uh, under apportionment A, highway block grants to cities and towns. $5 million would be a transfer to the highway and bridge betterment fund uh, that DOT uh, runs. $6 million would be for DOT to uh, acquire fleet vehicles and equipment. And $4 million would be appropriated for winter maintenance. I can continue if, unless there's any questions. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. We'll ask the questions. At, okay. Am I, am I silent? No, no I, I, we'll I, ask. Yeah, we'll ask the questions at the end. Okay. Uh, section two of this bill is relative to school building aid. And that starts on line 12 or this amendment rather. Uh, so in total, in total, there's um, uh, $17 million, 17.3 in the first year and 10.6 in the second year. And if we jump down to uh, lines 17 through 24, you will see what the purpose is. So of that amount, $8 million in fiscal 22 would go towards accelerating some of those tail payments. So it's, this is essentially an effort to pay down some of that outstanding obligation that the state has out through, I think, fiscal 2042. So um, districts that have projects um, on their pay routine payment schedule under this would receive an expedited portion prorated across all the projects by the department in the amount of $8 million total. And then in uh, subparagraph B on line 22, there's 9278000 in fiscal 22 and 10558000 in fiscal 23 for new school building aid projects. These appropriations would be from the education trust fund. As you know, the school building aid program now, we do budget that in the education trust fund. Subparagraph or paragraph uh, Roman 3 on line 25. As you all know, there is a um, cap on school building aid expenditures of $50 million per year. Uh, with this <laughs> new infusion of dollars into, into these payments, uh, I think because of timing, it's, prob it's probable DOE could be up against that cap. So what this does is it suspends that provision just for the biennium to allow uh, DOE to be able to make payments without being uh, non-compliant with that law. The net of all these actions and the actions previously taken to approve some of the uh, general fund uh, appropriations from, from yesterday. Section three on line 28 is the education trust fund transfer to the general fund to cover all the, the appropriations from before, as well as essentially the DOT portion of the appropriations today. So 
the amendment we had approved before 0989H had a transfer of 12 million in the first year and 10.7 in the second year. This would be 27.5 in the first year and 9.2 million in the second year. Okay. Are there any? I, I will add the, the net impact of all this for the education trust fund is uh, it would essentially balance to, to zero. It would be balanced to the penny. There'd be no additional surplus in the education trust fund or deficit at the end of fiscal 23, incorporating all these changes. Representative Heath. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I have to say all the things that relate to building aid and the cap, I, I can agree with all that. Um, and I, I just love to see more money going into building aid. What bothers me is taking money from the education trust um, and sending it to the Department of Transportation for all things that I would love to see added, by the way. So I'm struggling a lot with this because yes, indeed, DOT needs help um, really desperately, but I just am uncomfortable. It's a different utilization of the other dollars because in fact, they are going for an educational purpose and when we took money um, out of the, the amendment and we sent it to the university system, we, we transferred money from the trust to the um, general fund. Uh, we sent it to the university and to the community colleges to level fund them. We also paid for Running Start, which is near and dear to both of our hearts. But my big, big concern is taking money out of the education trust and sending it to the Department of Transportation um, so can you, somebody talk to me about that and, and make me feel better about that change because it does disturb me greatly because I'm afraid that it's going to set a precedent that we don't want to do. Okay, if I can, I think we all realize that um, the highway fund is in big time trouble. Okay, and the items that are in this particular bill, number one, affect the cities and towns. You all know that we had to reduce uh, the highway block grant because of um, money not available in, uh, in the, from the gas tax. Also, um, I believe Commissioner Shaheen said that um, the betterment would be um, reduced because of the lack of the, uh, the gas tax. And we have talked about not having money for the equipment. And um, so, I understand where you're coming from, uh, Representative Heath, but I also feel that although this money is all in the Education Trust Fund, that the needs of the Department of, um, yeah, the needs of the Highway Fund are such that it only makes sense to provide that money. Um, for, for the needs of the state. And um, I, I know, I understand where you're coming from, uh, but I also think that um, uh, putting the uh, 19 million, I think it was the figure from um, uh, for DOT, that we have in many ways, with the other, what, what I've proposed with the other funding have significantly helped the, um, the education of our, you know, the education side of it. With the um, school building aid, I know that that is a, a huge issue. And I also felt that by paying down the money that DOE owes, would allow us in the next biennium, you know, not this year, but in the next biennium, to have um, uh, extra dollars to provide to building aid. 
and I know that I know that there's um, a lot of conflict between building aid, okay, and transportation. So if we simply put this um, 19 million into building aid, in addition to the um, money that we have uh, that has been appropriated through this, I think that overall for the state, that when we are looking at um, the best use of the dollars at this time, okay? I may not feel that way in two years, but at this time, I feel that it is just so important that we are able to help out uh, the highway fund and continue to provide the things that are, are so necessary, not only for the towns, but also for the state. And I know we had talked yesterday about um, trying to move some money for equipment over to the, um, the highway fund uh, out of the education trust fund. So it's not, it's not a new concept, I'll put it that way. So that's kind of where, where I'm coming from and why I made these recommendations. Um, I just, I, I am just so concerned about the highway fund. I really, really am. And that this was the only way that I knew of to help bolster the, uh, the highway fund. So that's my, that's my pitch. Thank you, Madam Re Chair. You're welcome. Representative Murray. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just a couple things. First, I need to, I guess, preemptively apologize to Mickey because I wasn't able to find the, the uh, amendments in the packet that he sent because it's, it's this very faint blue ink that says down or show all amendments. So it always takes me forever to find that one. I did find them. So thank you for sending that out. Um, a concern I have is that this does not solve the problem of the highway fund going forward. Um, and so I totally agree that transportation needs help that, you know, and everything that you've said, they need all that money. But I just, you know, have to point out that this is not the solution to the highway fund. Um, and I wanted to ask um, if anyone can speak to, and maybe Mickey has um, some idea of this going forward, are there any unintended consequences that we that could be foreseen, other one than they wouldn't be unintended? Um, but in having the education trust fund go to zero. And the last thing I was concerned, I just, I and I know we don't know this, um, I am hopeful and probably fairly optimistic that there will be federal money that will help the transportation. Um, and no, I, you're shaking your head, no, is that not, do we not? Oh, I, I was hoping that there may be federal funds. I'll let you speak to that. But those are my concerns about this, but I am always all for helping out transportation as much as we possibly can. I do have a little anxiety about the education trust fund going to zero. So, uh, oh. Go ahead, Mickey. <clears throat> Say as far, as far as the education trust funds uh, position at the end of a year or biennium, um, there is a, a law that allows for um, the general fund to kick in any deficit the, the education trust fund may be in to finish a year. So as far as making adequacy payments, there's an open warrant and statute for that. And the general fund would make an automatic transfer to the education trust fund should it run a deficit. Um, those who have been around for a while recall for many years, we had tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in some years of a deficit in the education trust fund requiring a general fund uh, support at the end of the year to bring it back to a zero. So um, it's certainly not uncommon to have a budget plan with an education trust fund um, balance to be close to zero, or in a lot of cases, we've done it below zero. Uh, Matt, you wanted to speak. If we could, Mickey, bring him up. Hello. Uh, Yep, you're there. 
Excellent. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Nikki accurately covered most of what I wanted to say. The only thing I'll add is on the federal money side, there is a very small portion out of the American Rescue Plan that may be eligible for revenue replacement. We're still waiting on guidance from the US Treasury to identify exactly how um, we might be able to deploy those dollars for transportation. But to the extent that we can at all, it is a very small sliver um, of that total package. So uh, I don't have an estimate just yet, because again, we're still waiting on guidance, but that would be the only set of flexible money in the new federal bill uh, that could even be considered for this purpose. Yeah, I also understand from what uh, Commissioner Sheehan said that DOT itself is not expecting any um, dollars to take care of the uh, issues that I have covered in this uh, particular amendment. I, I would say that's definitely accurate. Um, I will say, of course, the feds did give us $41 million that we've already budgeted uh, in revenue replacement as part of the governor's budget, in addition to that $8.1 million uh, lapsed uh, from a previous House bill, HB 1817. Um, so that, that's all I would say is that we have seen some, some support. We've already kicked in some general fund support to balance the highway fund. Um, but we have used almost all of the resources at our disposal uh, at this point. Okay, did that answer your question, uh, Representative Murray? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Are there other questions that we have out there? Okay, uh, seeing none. Uh, <clears throat> Could I have a motion on amendment 1019H, please? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, is, there, are, is there any further discussion? Okay. Uh, Representative, Lin oh, I'm sorry. Representative Heath, you have a question. I do, because I'm really, I have to say, I'm really, really struggling with this. Um, I like everything we're doing. Um, but that said, I really don't like taking money out of the trust to send to transportation. Um, is there any money available from someplace else that could go to DOT? No. If I could just... Um clarify thing, something we've got we have another amendment after this 1018h which actually has a transfer going the other way so this amendment is going to transfer money from the education trust fund and spend it as general fund that next amendment is going to transfer general funds into the education trust fund and spend it as education trust fund after these two amendments are brought up it can be the committee's decision and give me the authority to essentially blend those two transfers together, net them together. Because at the end of the day here, these two amendments are actually sending general fund money into the education trust fund. And we could, and then that way the transfer from education trust fund wouldn't be associated with some of these spending items. I know that's kind of confusing. We're, we're talking across two documents, but um, that is essentially what's happening if, if both of these amendments here today, 1018 and 1019 are adopted. Okay. Does that answer your question, Mary? Representative Heath? Yes, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I'm still in a muddle to be honest though. Um, I just don't know what to do because this is a conundrum of, of I'd like to see these things take place but I'm just not sure about the education trust. So actually, um, based on that, um, probably we will go along with um, this amendment, um, but we'll continue to have a, another conversation after this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, Representative, are there any other questions, comments? Representative Lynn, would you call the roll, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Petrie. 
Representative Petrie votes yes. Uh, Representative Buca. Yes. Uh, Representative Heath. Heath votes yes. Thank you. Representative uh, Myrna. Representative Myrna, yes. Uh, Representative Lynn votes yes. Uh, Representative Murray. Murray votes yes. And uh, Representative Umberg. Representative Umberger votes yes. It's a vote of seven uh, to zero in the affirmative, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. So I, I maybe should have clarified at the beginning of that motion um, if you wanted to do it all together, but since we didn't, I would ask that you reconsider Amendment 0989H adopted yesterday as that this amendment you just adopted would essentially overwrite that. So I just wanna make it clear the committee's intent not to have both amendments. Okay, so we need to uh, we need to reconsider and vote no. Is that um, what you? I mean, just as long as it's clear that you're not going to adopt ultimately zero nine eight nine H. You adopted it. You want to reconsider that you'll vote no. I guess yeah. So I guess that's right. Okay, Representative Heath. Uh, Madam Chair, could Ricky just walk through the amendment that we're going to um, override? Um, because I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm fully understanding what I'm, I'm voting for. Uh, yes, Mary, we all have that problem. <laughs> Thank you. I so Mickey, what does it do? Right. Can Did I you? ask one? Oh, oh no. There we go. Okay. So through, through yeah, the act. Just hang on just a second. Yep. Uh, Representative Bucco, please, uh, Raise your hand on the uh, oh okay, on your computer, yes. okay, so that we can uh, keep ourselves straight. So, Representative Murray, or I'm sorry, was it Representative Heath? Is that correct? You had a question. Um, my oops, my question. You you wanted um, questions being addressed right now by Mickey to. Um, exactly yeah. what this amendment does versus the amendment that we just did. So what are we undoing? So this, if you recall, the amendment we just adopted had um, a transfer, an education trust fund transfer to the general fund for the uh, appropriations. We had already done that to pay for previously adopted items that the committee did. So we don't want two transfers. That transfer amount that you just approved was net of everything we already did. So I already trued it up to what we need and we this previous one's no longer necessary. A question, just quick question. It doesn't undo anything we did for the community college, the no. university system, no, none of that. Not. It's no. simply, okay, thank you. Yep. Representative Bucco, you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you. Am I on? Okay. Yes, you are. Um, could I ask that uh, Mickey to uh, resend those amendments because I don't remember seeing them and I, I may have deleted them with the other 200 emails that I was sure. trying to get through. Uh, I, I can certainly send that to, to you or um, I don't know if Representative Bucco, you've explored the division two webpage. Every amendment is right on there too, listed by the number. So I'll, maybe I'll send you the link and then that That's, way it's easier to find everything. Yes, thank you, thank you. That's fine. Okay. Okay, does that take care of your question, Tom? Yes, uh, that's fine, thank you. Okay, all right. So, um, could I have a motion to reconsider Amendment 0989H? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Can I, you know, can I, I'm sorry, can I just ask the question? I want to make sure that what we're doing is correct. If we, if, if the idea would be that we would vote not, that we would vote no and not consider amend, amendment 0989, then doesn't that mean that that, that we're leaving that amendment in place? Shouldn't Shouldn't we be voting yes? To I, think, 
Yeah, I think technically you would yes to reconsider it and then just ultimately not adapt, adopt it again. So I think, mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't have to follow parliamentary procedures here, if you just want to make a clear motion that you're deleting section 0989 from your recommended amendments, that works for me. I just needed to be clear that the idea was that last amendment replaces the old one that we adopted. And I think everyone's on the same page with that, with, with what's going on here, I hope. Um, okay. So why don't we why don't we try what Mickey said? I'll amend my motion to uh, delete 0989H. And I'll second that. Okay. And, and <laughs> that works that works for me. That works. That works. Okay, yeah, that, good. That, okay. okay. So uh Representative Lynn, would you please call the roll? Yes, thank you. Uh, Representative Petrie. Petrie votes yes. Representative Buca. Uh, yes. Representative Heath. Uh, Heath votes yes. Representative Myrna. Myrna votes yes. Uh, Representative Lynn votes yes. Uh, Representative Murray. Murray votes yes. And Representative Umberger. Uh, votes yes. Thank you. It's a seven to zero vote in the affirmative, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Buco. Could you uh, figure out how to drop your hand? I got okay, it. Just raise <laughs> hand. Uh, yeah. Right. Oh, it's gone now. It's, uh, raise. Not, raise uh, hand. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, yeah. I know you've been gone for two weeks, so uh, it, it's, it's all new. <laughs> it's all new. It's like uh, going back to uh, January, so it's okay. All right. Um, Mickey, we have two more amendments. Is that correct? We do. Yes. Okay. Um, let me see if I can... Uh, okay, that's the wrong one. See if I can summarize what these two amendments do. Uh, because it's the result, what's happening is, is that we're spending the same money in different ways. Is that correct, Mickey? Uh, between these two amendments? Yeah. Uh, Close. Uh, so the, the the one amendment relative to SWEPT is around $100 million. The um, the other amendment relative to education funding is closer to just over $140 million, the net impact of, of that one. So, um, but that's, that's they're both um, would essentially, the way that they're written, have a general fund impact as the education trust fund to all the decisions that we've made to this point the education trust fund is at a right at zero. So um, anything you with these two amendments would, would essentially affect general. Okay. So uh, Representative Heath, would you um, talk to us about your amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so Madam Chair, what I understand your amendment is going to do is it's going to transfer um, into the trust um, $100 million. And that money would be used to indeed um, put um, toward reducing the um, overall statewide property tax on education. Um, the amendment that I am proposing and, and I have a number of questions that would go with that, but let me let me talk to my amendment. My amendment, as I, it would be H, basically what's in HB 623. And what 623 does at, at a critically important time in our, our, our situation that we're in right now, it returns funding levels to that which school districts received in the 2021, the second year of the biennium. And it um, 
includes disparity aid and some of the targeted aid that we sent to school districts. And um, I really think that this is critically important to our school districts because the reduction in, in prop, uh, the statewide property taxes, you know, what does this mean for a, a community like Berlin? And cutting SWEPT simply ultimately really puts a further burden on all the other towns that don't retain their, their SWEP funds like some of the others and that difference has to be made up ultimately. So while I, I totally agree with the concept of reducing statewide property taxes, um, I, can't, I, I can't in good heart, um, knowing that there is this much money available deny the school districts that so desperately they need these funds. So what I'm proposing, and you have um, uh, Jeff McLynch put together a funding chart and you will see with 623 on that chart that you received this morning from Mickey, the amount of money utilizing 623 that each school district across our state would receive if we were to adopt 623. And, and I think this is something that um, we saw in, in the report from the, the state uh, the school funding commission, the importance of really sending money to those districts that need it so desperately. Um, why we are as a state spending enormous amounts of money on education, those school districts that can least afford it are struggling the most with their property taxes. So I think in what you're trying to do, Madam Chair, is you're trying to overall reduce statewide property taxes when in fact, if we were to adopt 623, I think it would be a win-win situation for everybody. We would in fact be providing greater dollars to those school districts most in need. And at the same time, the other communities would also be receiving funds and we would do nothing to um, compromise their um, additional SWEP money that most uh, many of those communities um, that are so well off uh, continue to keep. So with that, Madam Chair, I put forward the amendment that, that um, we have this morning and that amendment is number 0721H. And I thank you for consideration. And I hope the committee as a whole will consider this, what it can do for our entire state and every single school district across our state, considering what everyone has gone through with the pandemic the numbers, um, what this also will do, will, it will increase school district enrollment numbers, free and reduced, as well as numbers that will um, take it back to what the numbers were previously. So we see a lot of things happening in this amendment as a result um, of us, my asking you to consider this. So I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Heath. Are there any comments or questions? Okay, uh, Representative Lynn. Yes, can I just can I just ask a question? And am I understanding correctly that the re that the reason that a school district in without this amendment that the reason that a school district might not receive an amount that was the equivalent of what it received in the um, in the prior year is that there's been a reduction in the number of students in the school district. Is that is that correct? Yes. All right. And and so if I'm uh, if and am I correct that, that there may be a whole bunch of reasons for the reduction? Uh, uh, presumably to the extent that the reason was, um, uh, had something to do with COVID, by the time that this uh, budget is uh, in effect, that should, I would think, largely be over. And to the extent that so that those students would return unless those students have decided based upon the, the, the public schools, the manner in which the public schools have dealt with COVID, that they're no longer satisfied with the public schools and have decided yeah. to go to private. Yeah, thanks. So. 
and have decided to go to private schools. Hello. Okay, I'm sorry. I had a call and I need to answer it. Um, I think the answer to all of your questions, uh, Representative Lynn, is yes. Um, so in, oh, I'm, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I apologize. No, no, that's fine. Within the uh, formula right now, we have the um, stabilization grant, which, um, did you get it? Which, yeah, which takes us back to um, the um, providing dollars for um, student enrollment in the past. I think that's how I can explain that. It may not be, somebody may have a better explanation than that, but there are dollars in there for that quote unquote stabilization um, requirement. And, uh, and that helps in many cases, uh, towns like uh, Berlin that lost, um, lost a lot of students when they, um, when they um, lost the uh, paper mill and any number of other things. And so that was why the stabilization grant was there. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, Representative Heath. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I just uh, could uh, make a couple of comments. Um, yeah, excuse me just a second. Mickey, could you take this amendment off? Is this, this is, or is this? This here is, oh. rep this is Representative Heath's amendment. Okay, I, that's what I was looking for. Excuse me, thank you. Go ahead, Representative Heath. I, I apologize for not being able to read. Thank you. I just wanted to talk to um, um, Representative Lynn's comments and also um, just to talk a little bit about what was done in the last biennium in terms of funding for school districts. I think due to the COVID pandemic and the um, urgency for, for children to stay at home, yes, in fact, a lot of children did not appear on the rolls. Um, however, we're starting to see the children come back. In fact, a lot of children did go to non-public schools. They went to private schools because many private schools did stay open. But at the same time, school districts are right now, as we speak, being forced to do their individual school district budgets based on numbers that are significantly lower, low, much lower than the previous years. So it's what we're seeing, and um, actually SB 135, which Representative Hennessy brought forward, begins to address that, but it does not include in her in her uh, bill, um, the elements that, that we see in the funding year uh, 2021, the disparity aid and some of the targeted aid, which we believe at this point is, is the most critical need across our state for school funding. So with that, I just really want to impress, and again, I urge you to look at the printout or at look at the numbers for your school district, particularly that Mickey did send out that was uh, put together by um, uh, Representative uh, Mc, uh, not Reverend, uh, by Jeff McLynch um, from his organization. I also want to say that this morning in House Ed, um, they are hearing SB 135. Um, and so I think that this is very much in the conversation to bring those enrollment numbers up um, and to, in fact, make school districts harmless from the just myriad of issues that COVID, COVID has had 
on school districts in relation to personnel, in relation to technology needs. And I get it, I agree wholeheartedly that there are federal dollars, large federal dollars coming into school districts. But that said, that does not mitigate the issue of the conversation going on right now in every school district um, about the increase in or de significant de decrease enrollments and the amount of funding um, that needs to, school districts need to know what the impact on their property taxes will be. And based on where we are in time right this minute, school districts are struggling as will be taxpayers with the results of that money. And I do not believe that the uh, proposal that's going to be coming forward with the $100 million to reduce the statewide property taxes will ameliorate the really impact of what we have currently, the current situation across our state with school districts and their budgets and having to deal with ultimately is, is kind of a, a crisis immediately. So I thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank you, uh, Representative Lynn, for, for raising some of these issues. Can't hear you. Excuse Am I? Me. No, it's me. Oh. The, the, the cost of your bill is roughly $44 million more than the 100 million. So how are you recommending, I, I know there's nothing in here, how, how are you recommending that that number be reduced to the 100 million? Or are you suggesting that we put the whole 144 million in? Thank you, Madam Chair. That also was part of my reluctance on voting yes on the um, amendment that we just had, because basically that would have funded the increase to 623 that I was hoping to do um, and, and really make school districts whole and, and bring back that level of funding to the level that we provided um, for school districts in 21. So um, again, I, I don't know exactly where the additional funding would come from, uh, but I believe revenues are coming in stronger than we had anticipated. And there are a number of possible opportunities that may present themselves so this money will come in. Um, so with that said, I would, um, I would end my testimony there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, that's all right. Uh, Representative Murray. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I've been sitting here and I mean, both issues are extremely important. And so what I'm thinking in my head is trying to suss out, um, you know, basically, where's the greater good? Uh, they're both good. What, where's the balance in terms of um, how this will have, you know, where's, where would the better effect be? And I lean towards um, Representative Heath's amendment because of how it addresses the specific issue in the school. And as schools are made whole, then that provides relief to all the communities as well with regards to SWEP. So I guess just, you know, I'm looking at in terms of trying to figure out the greater good, the best way to go. And um, I think I, right at this point, I have to support uh, Representative Heath's amendment for that reason. Okay. Uh, are there any other comments from anyone? Okay, um, <clears throat> the concern that I have with this amendment, and you have identified it, mm -hmm. is that in the last budget, you increased the amount of money to school districts. Mm -hmm. And so now they expect this amount of money in their adequate education. And so what happens is that we end up in the same situation in the next biennium. 
that if we provide additional dollars in adequacy at this time, we will then have to go, we will, we will hear the same thing coming back for 23 and 24. And it's, even though in your HB2 last year, you indicated that this was one-time money. So uh, even if we identify this as one-time money, the expectation is going to be that it will be there going forward. And I'm not sure that we should be spending one-time money to set ourselves up for the same argument every two years. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I brought in the amendment to lower SWEP because that affects every, every single person that pays taxes rather than adding an expectation to the school districts that we may or may not be able to uh, fund in the future. And that's, that's the thing that, um, you know, we, in 21, 21 and 22, we had extra money. We put it into the, uh, into the system and now they expect it. And that's where, that's where my problem is. So I am not in favor of increasing expectations of the school districts uh, over, over time. If we can, you know, if, if, uh, if the revenue comes in and um, we're, you know, we're in a, in a position in the next budget to bring uh, 623 forward or whatever else, uh, because we've got several study committees going on right now on, uh, or they will be going on. I know the one was completed, but I believe there's legislation out there to uh, create another study committee. So, okay, that's, I, so I, I cannot support this uh, Representative Heath, and I'm very sorry about that. But uh, Representative Murray, did you have some comments? Um, just a quick question. If, if it's $100,000, um, and being new, I'm not always sure, could we prorate that $100,000 to the school districts? You know, as, as part of the 623, um, they can't get all the amount. We don't have that. But um, could we prorate it so that the school districts directly get that money? Uh, Mickey, do you want to answer that question? Uh, we don't have an amendment that does anything like that. I mean, we could certainly craft, you know, work on a, a way to infuse $100 million even or pick a number into the education funding formula. Um, that's not something we've, we've done to this point or have anything prepared, but just like any other uh, idea, you know, certainly we could, we could work on something and, and craft an amendment. Representative Heath. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to go to your proposal. And just my big concern is cutting SWEP simply shifts further the burden into local property taxes where, where towns and communities least can afford it. Um, I have to say that, that Representative um, Murray's idea is one that certainly has um, a good option and, and um, we could think about what an amendment would look like that would in fact increase the adequacy amount um, for all school districts, but also um, reducing somewhat the um, disparity aid and the, um, uh, the other um, funding, the targeted funding that we put out. So we, we would just uh, proportion it out. And, I would ask that maybe um, we have time to um, step back and put an amendment like that together so that in fact, 
we would move, we would have time to look at that um, as a whole with the amount that, with that hundred million dollar amount. Because quite frankly, I don't, I think the hundred million going into SWEPT doesn't mitigate the issues. It doesn't talk to the enrollment issues. It doesn't talk to so many of the, the crisis issues that our school districts are facing right now. So I wish that we could compromise together utilizing the funding that's available and look at a better amendment that we could come forward with that would be a win-win for our school districts across the state and especially the children of New Hampshire. Okay, uh, are there any other comments? Okay, seeing none. Um, Representative Heath, we will um, we will um, let me let me get my brain. Am I? Let me get my brain together. Um, we have we have two competing ideas about what to do with this money, and. I would suggest that we vote on this. And then if this passes, we can uh, bring in an amendment and reconsider this, okay? And um, that way, you know, we can do that tomorrow, or, I guess or later today, I don't know if that can, that amendment can be uh, completed today or not, but uh, go ahead, Representative Heath. Um, Madam Chair, in light of what you just said, I would like to bring forward um, amendment number 0721H. And I would look for a second on that motion, please. Second. Okay, uh, Mickey, this is the $144 million amendment. Uh, one, yeah, 141 is the number that I have above the governor's uh, recommended budget levels for, uh, for this amendment. Okay, so uh, Representative Murray, or sorry, Representative Heath, are you withdrawing 0721H and no, replacing. Chair, I would like to move forward on this amendment, um, knowing that we um, will go forward with working to build another amendment utilizing the $100 million that we have available. Okay, thank you. Representative uh, Murray. Um, might it be possible to have that amendment this afternoon? Mickey, <laughs> is that too much to ask? So I would just need to be clear on what we're looking for for an amendment. Are you looking for just a straight proration of uh, the amendment that you're going to do now? So essentially, total education grants to each municipality shall not be less, but then apply some sort of a $100 million statewide cap that DOE would apply pro rata across all town. Like, I just need some uh, direction as far as where to go with with how you're, uh, how you conceptualize capping it at 100 million. That was my initial idea. Uh, you know what you just expressed. Um, I am open to suggestions if there is a better way to formulate that. Uh, Representative Heath. Madam Chair, yes, thank you. Um, I would like to go ahead um, with the understanding that, that we're gonna go forward with another amendment because what 623 does is it changes, it does a lot of things with the enrollment numbers, bring reduced lunch um, uh, for those numbers 
uh, it seems like a little simple amendment, but a lot happens in it. So if we could accept this amendment with the understanding that we'll come back to take the elements of 623, um, and, and Mickey knows this well, um, and then create an amendment, we'll um, amend this amendment and come back with the second amendment that stays within the $100 million, but in fact makes the school, all school districts whole. Um, based on um, the elements of 623. Which is, which is not whole, but an increase. Yes. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not a question of whole. We can't say that. It's a right. question of, Sorry. Uh, of a $144 million increase. So, okay. Uh, who else has their hand up? I'm sorry. Well, I, I seconded... Um, Representative Heath's motion. This is no. on 0721. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Petrie. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, uh, I know uh, when I go to the store, I make sure I got enough money in my wallet. Uh, and I think we should uh, wait and see what uh, we have for revenue at the end of April, we'll probably have a better idea. Uh, and 135, SB 135 is coming our way, so we can uh, we can add more money. We could possibly add, you know, what we, you know, the same amount as we did in uh, previous year. So I think that uh, this is going, uh, you know, you can't, you can't spend it if you don't have it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, let me just, oh, I'm sorry. I've got somebody's hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I would consider withdrawing this amendment if we would be able to wait um, for us to work with um, Mickey to come up with a new amendment utilizing the amount of money that we have available, the $100 million that we do have available right now. Okay, it, the only problem we have with that, Mary, uh, represent, sorry, Representative Heath, is that we have another amendment to vote on today. And so from, from my perspective, um, we, we can vote on the amendment, these two amendments, and if they pass, then they pass. And the and if if there needs to be amendments made, if they pass, and there needs to be amendments made, then I think I can I would agree that we could get the amendment, come back and do whatever needed to be done. The Madam Chair, I, I will maintain my amendment as it stands. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So uh, Mickey, which amendment should I do first? That's totally up to you, Representative. We we haven't really reviewed um, 1018 yet. We've talked about it, but we I don't know if the committee wanted to actually see the amendment and just understand what's going on. Um, I feel like we're we're deep into the conversation with 0721 right now, and we do have a motion on 0721H, so you may want to do that one first. Okay, I think that makes sense. Representative Lynn, would you please call the roll on 0721 H? Yes, thank you. Um, Representative Petrie. Representative Petrie reluctantly votes no. Representative Buca. Uh, yes. Uh, Representative Heath. Heath votes yes. Representative Myrna. Representative Myrna votes no. Representative Lynn votes no. Uh, Representative Murray. Murray. Oh, Representative you, I'm sorry, oh. Murray votes yes. I think I got my toggles so, backwards. Representative <laughs> Murray votes yes, and Representative Umberger. <laughs> Representative Umberger votes no. All right, Madam Chair, it's a vote of four to three. Um, 
uh, in the negative. Okay. So we are now back to um, this amendment is defeated. So uh, let's look at um, 1018. If we could bring that up, please. I think Andrea has that up there for us now. Okay. So just so everyone understands, we, we discussed this amendment as to what's going on, but for fiscal year 23 state fiscal year collections for the statewide education property tax, this amendment would require that the DRA set the tax rate at an amount to raise $263 million versus $363 million, which is per the statutory level. Essentially what this would do is result in $100 million less in swept revenue, statewide education property tax revenue to the education trust fund in fiscal 23. <clears throat> and then if you look down to uh, section two of the bill on line eight, there is a $100 million appropriation from the general fund to the education trust fund, essentially netting uh, to zero between these two actions as far as uh, impact on the education trust fund balance. Okay, are there any questions on this? Representative Heath. Madam Chair, I just wanna reiterate my concerns. Um, I believe that cutting SWEP simply shifts the burden um, into local property taxes in those towns and cities that can least afford it. In addition, it does nothing to um, look at the enrollment numbers and the difficulties that school districts have. I would fervently ask you to vote no on this amendment so that we can come back with another amendment uh, based on our previous conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Lynn. Yeah, I, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure. So I'm, I'm, I, what this would do would reduce the education property tax and make up for that money from the general fund. Is that correct? That's correct. correct. Okay. I, thank you very much. Yeah. We're not, we're not taking any money out of SWEP. We're just replacing the reduction in taxes across the state for um, the uh, property tax payers. Representative Murray. So is this just for this year or this, I guess this biennium? Um, so presumably in the next biennium, the SWEP would go back to where it is now? Okay, let me just say this. SWEP in 23 will be we will collect from the taxpayers the 263. We will replace the 100 million uh, that isn't there with general funds money. So there's no change in how much money will be uh, provided by SWEP to fund adequate education. That number of 363 stays there. It's just the method of how we pay for it. All right, follow up? Certainly. So presumably because we're putting 100 million into this fund, people would likely expect that their swept tax to go down. So when we come to the point where we don't put in the 100 million again, then we might expect the swept fund, the swept rate to go back up to what it was in order to um, generate the 363. So this is um, an event for this biennium, but it's not necessarily an event going forward. It's not- uh, that's, that's, that's correct. Okay, that's so correct. It's a, one, it's a one off, it's a one time. Right. Thank you. Right. And that would be the same thing with um, Representative Heath's amendment, that it would be a one-off because we don't, well, who knows? <laughs> but we can't, we can't promise the future 
as you know. Um, I wish I could, but we can't. And, uh, and that's, um, that's one of my major concerns with uh, Representative Heath's amendment is that we are setting people up for um, uh, trying, thinking that we are shorting them in the future. Representative Heath. With that said, Madam Chair, I, I really ask the, the members of the committee to think about number one, for local school districts trying to establish their budget, this would mean they would know how much money would be forthcoming. It would be a bigger advantage to those school districts across our state that are struggling with coming up with significant dollars to in fact pay their local property taxes and it just, it, it doesn't do for our schools what we need to have done. We don't change the numbers. We don't uh, address the enrollment numbers. Um, so I, again, I would ask the committee to vote no on this amendment so that we can come back this afternoon with another amendment that uses the $100 million to really address fully, and I believe, in a better way, again, swept will impact some of the most wealthy towns. People are used to paying the, prop, the statewide property taxes. We end up hurting those districts that least can afford it. So um, I ask you to vote no on this amendment. Um, I, could some, is it uh, Representative Murray, are you, have your hand raised? Um, yes, I do. Um, I, I don't know if I was before Representative Lynn or not, but I can be quick. Um, as we did a reconsideration on a previous amendment, regardless of how this goes, if it's up or down, is it still possible to bring in um, the sort of amendment that we were discussing this afternoon? Regardless of how this goes, could we still bring in the other amendment for consideration, for consideration and then seeing how that goes, have reconsideration on this one? I think the answer to that would be yes. Okay, you. Um, uh, Andrea, could you take this down because my computer doesn't show me who uh, wants to talk. And I think we all know what this says. So if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. One Thank moment. you. There you are, Madam Chair. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, Representative Lynn, you have your hand raised. Yes, I uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I just want to make sure that I'm understanding, um, in light of what Representative Heath had, had said, if if we approve this amendment, it does not result in any lower funding of monies going for education. It simply means that instead of the money coming from the statewide education property tax, it will come from other state revenue sources, which does not include the statewide education property tax. So that to the extent that most of that of those other sources involve monies from the business profits tax or the business enterprise tax, it will mean that uh, to quote some of the people um, that I've heard talk about this, it will mean that out of state, big out of state corporations are paying more, um, uh, uh, paying a bigger share of the cost of education than the property taxpayers are. Um, unless I'm missing something, that seems to me to, um, seems to me to be um, what, uh, what we're talking about. And so I guess I'm, I don't, I don't think I have a problem with that. Mickey, would you like to uh, provide some sort of thought to Representative Lynn? Um, I don't think I can really get into a whole lot of detail or thoughts on that, but to the extent that less of the pool of money for funding education trust fund expenditures comes from directly from property tax 
receipts, I think his point is is on the right track. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, I will agree, and I hope that everyone will nod their head yes, that we will vote on 1018, but we will also allow Representative Heath and whoever to bring in an amendment this afternoon that we can discuss. And if that one passes, then we would reconsider whatever the vote is on this. Is there anybody? <laughs> okay, Representative Heath. Just to be clear, so I know what I'm voting on. So if I were to vote yes on this amendment, you are agreeing that um, we'll have time to work with Mickey to come back this afternoon. Well, um, whenever, whenever you're amended. Whenever it's ready uh, to in fact amend this bill and change the purpose of the $100 million that you are talking about. That's what I think is what I said. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you know, if it wasn't Thursday after Thursday morning, that could be something that you would do anyhow. And so, since it's Thursday morning, I uh, I recognize that uh, we need to follow the same sort of uh, protocol that we have every time. So, yes. You have another question? Yes. Um, so if we vote right now, um, chances are that as a division, we're not gonna be able to come back. So would this be an amendment that um, I would bring forward to the full finance committee? No, we can bring it back here. We can bring it back here. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, yeah. we just have to uh, figure out a time. And that's, uh, that's going to be you know, it, it may be, it may be best just to do it tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock because we have our, we have our schedule, I think, set that we were going to um, be here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. May, um, so what I think that I'm going to vote yes on is that I would agree to the $100 million with the understanding that we will work with Mickey and come up with an amendment to this for reconsideration of this amendment um, at some point before it goes to full finance. Yes. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. Okay. Is, um, is this afternoon an option, Representative Umberger? Because we could probably turn this around pretty quick if you did want to finish business today. Well, let me let me see how many people are available. This at. is everyone available at two o'clock or three o'clock or whatever. Am I seeing yeses from everybody? Okay, so um, let me just look at my schedule. I mm -hmm. I think I'm okay, but. Um, Yes, I, uh, <laughs> the one day I only have one meeting. Okay, so uh, Mickey, what do you think's the best time? I think two o'clock might be a, a, a good target. We could try to um, turn something around for that. Um, I, I, I have faith OLS will be able to turn something around quick for us. Okay, and if we don't, um, I want to know who the stand-up comic is, so that we can uh, we can <laughs> we can use our time wisely until until OLS uh, gets the uh, the thing back. Or do I need to hire somebody to come in for that? Okay, Representative Heath. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, I just um, implore the committee to look at the handout that, um, uh, that uh, Mickey sent to you showing the difference in towns and communities, even based on a prorated uh, basic basis, um, there is a lot more money that will be going in um, to what school districts will be receiving. So I really ask for that consideration this afternoon. Okay. We'll vote oh. yes on this bill, on this amendment. All right, thank you very much. Um, so our, I don't think I have a motion, do I? Um, one zero one eight, or do I? No, not yet. Okay. okay, Representative Petrie made the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Would you please call the roll? Yes, certainly. Um, uh, Representative Petrie. Representative Petrie votes yes. Representative Buka. Yes. Uh, Representative Heath. Heath votes yes, trusting my chair. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, Representative Murner. Representative Murner votes yes. Uh, Representative Lynn votes yes. Uh, Representative Murray. Murray votes yes. And Representative Umberger. Representative Umberger votes yes. All right. It's a vote of seven to zero in the affirmative, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. And uh, we all understand that uh, we'll, oh, Mickey is, well, we, we'll have to wait till two o'clock, right, to vote on the other things that we need to vote on? Um, I mean, you, it's really a formality if you want to um, just make it clear that you're done with your work. Once you're done, done everything, we can do a final vote saying, you know, uh, House Bill 1 and 2 are closed out with the amendments that we've already previously adopted to this point. So uh, perhaps we can save that for the end of the back end of today. Okay, yeah, and um, and we also need to give you authority to true up things or whatever, Yeah, we, whatever. We, yeah, we usually get that officially with the full committee, but if you wanna just make it clear, you, you trust me to make sure I carry out the division's work, that's fine too, that works too. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't trust you, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is there anything else at this point? We need to let them get to work. So um, I'll see you all at uh, two o'clock. Thank you Have very nice much. No problem.